So on the bench today, it's not so important exactly what this is, because um, we just I want to show a procedure. You know, if you buy something like this, now this is a frequency counter designed for radios. Uh, has a input and output on the back. So you hook up in line with your antenna, or you can use it as a standalone counter. It's not a high precision counter. It's just you know a gen. As you can see, it measures even down to a hundred or tens of hertz, but. The customer sent this in and wants a power cord for this. Uh, I don't think there's a published uh, schematic on this. So this is one of those things you might get and, well, now you're stuck. Because <laughs> you get it. You didn't see the back of it if you bought it online, possibly. You just figured power cord. You know, you're thinking, oh, it's AC. I'll just, any cord, any old, probably old two-pin cord will work in it. And you get it and the power cord socket ends up being some oddball plug. So this is an old Sense Jones plug, which I need to, you can see the pins are a little bit bent, I need to straighten them out. But you're looking at that going, well, that ain't good. <laughs> For starters, if it was AC without a ground, it would only need three pins, and there's four. So you might think, ah, well, maybe they're just not using one pin. And you look on the inside and no, 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 it's all four pins are used. <laughs> so, on something like this that's an accessory for mobile radios, a lot of times what you'll have is, is this would have come with, either come with or had an option. Uh, it probably would have come with the AC power cord, uh, and then might have come with, or it may have been a separate option, it would have come with a DC power cord. So you can run this off of a power supply that you're using for your radio. That way you don't need to run this off of AC. And you don't need to use the internal power supply. Um, but now you're stuck. Now you've got four pins on the back. What goes to what? <laughs> you know, you may you may look at this and go, well, let's see. There's a, there's a gray wire and it goes up to the fuse. And then that turns into brown. So it must be... And they got brown here, and here's another brown. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, the brown, yeah, brown there, and there's a gray. So you're, and get confused and think, well, that's the AC. Nah, you're probably going to let some smoke out, out of this thing if you were to hook up to those two terminals. Uh, so what you want to do is, is figure out the wiring without actually hooking it up for starters. <laughs> now, you could very easily power this up with a DC power supply, which is what I did. I wanted to verify this thing worked first because I, you know, to let the customer know if it would need any repairs because he didn't even know if this thing powered up. So the first thing I wanted to do was basically not use the the built-in power supply, use an external laboratory power supply on a, you know, current I had set to a current limit, and then I could just hook up. So, you know, first thing you want to do something like this, look at it. So check the plugs, and you know, okay, now this plug's already undone. That goes over there. But you can see there's a plug here, it goes to a transistor and a transformer, so okay, that's not going to be it. Coax cable, obviously that's going to be for frequency, that's not going to have anything to do with the power supply. So you basically come down to, there's one plug left. Uh, now, fairly easy to see that there's a black wire that comes up here and goes to the center tap of this transformer. So there are five connections on this transformer. There's two in the back here, and then there's three on this side. Now, if you see two wires on one side and three on the other side, that makes it very easy to, to figure out which is the input and which is the output. The input is going to be 100, if it's going to be a step-down transformer, which is what this is, because you're stepping down from 120 volts to a lower voltage. The two wires are going to be what hook up to the 120 volts. So, that's a given on the back side. That's great. You figured that much out. The three wires here are going to be the output. So it's going to be a center tap, and then there's going to be basically a positive and, and negative, because you're going to have the half waves here, and, they are, and they're actually using down here. Another thing, you can look at the diodes in something like this. There are three diodes. So you're thinking, well, it's not a full wave bridge rectifier. Nope, they're only using two, actually. This one is just a reverse protection diode in case you were to hook up your DC power cord backwards. So this is actually the rectifier circuit for this power supply. It's just a half-wave rectifier. It's two diodes. Um, now, there's only one plug left. It's got a black wire that runs up to that center tap. So it's pretty safe to assume that that's ground. The other thing you can do is, uh, 
the capacitors. Now, I've already replaced the electrolytic capacitors in this, so these are here. But you could pull this board up and out. Very easy to get out. Just unplug the plugs, four screws, one in each corner. Pull the board out. See, make sure that this big... Now, usually the large trace on a board is going to be your ground plate. But if you, you doubt it, you can always pull the board up. Check the actual negative sides of all these electrolytic capacitors. Make sure which is the ground plane. And then do a continuity test. So I just have... Ah, you can't see the displays. I don't have it inverted. It's just blinding the camera. But I just have that set up in a continuity test so it'll make a tune. Anytime it makes continuity. So you know you touch the trace here, you can hear there's continuity. So first thing you can do is is test from from the board ground. So you know this is going to be your DC board ground to that black wire. And you can hear we've got continuity. So we know this is the negative terminal, okay? So that leaves this being the positive. So what I could, when what I did was, is I just actually attached an external power supply here, negative to this, and 13.8 volts to that orange wire. Counter fired up, good to go. So now we need to figure out the wiring for the plug. Again, don't need anything more than a continuity tester, ohm meter, just something to check for continuity. So, now I've pulled the switch out because it's just going to be a lot easier than trying to get to wires that are kind of trapped up underneath of there. Um, and luckily this has plugs, so I could just unplug that over there. So we want, to, we want to trace this out. Now we know this is going to be one of our 120 volt line cord attachments, okay? That goes to the fuse, comes out of the fuse, and goes to the transformer. So you're guaranteed this top terminal facing me is one of the 120 volt lines. Now you may have thought this brown wire down here was the other one because like I say they're using gray and brown it seems like for the AC. You would be wrong. <laughs> and an easy way to test that theory uh, let's see here is check from that brown wire to either of these other terminals. Now, make sure that your switch is in the on position, which I have it, because this has off, and then just two different positions depending on what resolution you want the counter to be. But you want this to be in the on position. So what I want to do is, is check from that unknown brown wire, and I want to see, does it go back here? Ah, it doesn't. I'm checking directly to the terminals that would be the 120 volt connection at this transformer, and there's nothing there. Check the transformer here, here, here. Ah, look at that. I've got connection, and that's touching the orange wire, okay? Okay, so that means that is actually the DC connection. So if it was using the DC power cord, it would be the top inside edge terminal. That's why I say, don't always go by wire color. Don't assume reds are positive, and if you see a gray wire and a brown wire on a fuse holder that you know goes at 120 volts, don't assume that all the other brown and gray wires are also going to be that. Um, so now, we need to check other ones. Now, we have already know this black wire that goes down to that DC board connection here goes to this center tap, and you can follow that center tap down to, to the bottom inside terminal, the black wire right there so we know that's the negative so there's our DC connection positive is, is the top inside edge or brown wire negative is the bottom inside connection so that leaves only two more terminals here well we already know this top one is the one for the AC the other one is this red one so let me move this back a little bit uh, let's see red. So, we can check from red. We'll see we have continuity to the red one here. And then we can just go around and check the other terminals. So there's our orange. Now we know that's actually the DC. Okay. Nothing there. Check at the brown one. Nothing there. Come around to the gray one. Aha! So there's our other one. So that means the AC 
That's the other side of your power cord. Comes in the red wire, goes to the power switch, comes out the gray wire, and if you actually trace that out, you'll see that the gray wire is the other wire to the transformer, which makes perfect sense. So it's just that simple. The top outside edge, that's 120 volt line. The bottom outside edge, the red wire, that's our other 120 volt connection. And then the two inside terminals, the top and the bottom, or the brown and the black wires are the connections to if you wanted to make up a DC power cord. Now I've got a bunch of these Cinch Jones plugs, so you know now I can make up a, an AC power cord. He doesn't want a DC power cord. And I know, you can see the direction here, the, the terminals are designed so you can only plug this in in one direction. These top two terminals go in this orientation, and these two terminals go in this orientation. So that tells me that that one and that one are the AC power connection. Now, this uses, uh, back in the day, we did not have polarized plugs. If you're familiar with your power cords nowadays, one terminal is wider than the other side. That's a polarized plug. The small terminal on a polarized cord is the hot wire. So that's what the AC is actually coming out of your wall outlet on, is the, is the, the, the narrow terminal. The wider terminal is the neutral. And then in your breaker panel, that would go to ground. So what we want to do is, is we want to make sure we hook up that hot lead. So when you hook up a power cord, ideally, you should be using a modern cord with a polarized plug. You should hook, when you wire this plug up, you want to make sure that the hot wire is the one that goes to the switch. So that's this red wire here, which would be this terminal bottom closest to me. That would be the hot, that way when the AC, it, it gets no farther, the only place that that voltage is present in here then when it's turned off is to the switch. This wire to the switch and then it's cut off. The other side will be attached to the neutral in your breaker panel. Uh, like I say, you always want to try to keep your the, the line, the, the live side of your 120 volt outlet ideally sh should normally go to your switch. That way it's not permanently on and well it won't be on but if you hook it up where the hot wire goes to the fuse and it's going to go to the transformer it's going to come out the other side of the transformer and back over to the switch ideally you don't want that when you turn something off you want that power to be at the minimum basically the minimum amount of components and wiring inside of the device you're working on so there's just a really quick way like i say all you really need is a continuity tester ohm meter, something just to test it out. Just kind of use your electrical common sense. Look for grounds on capacitors. You know that's going to be attached to the DC ground on whatever it is. Trace that out. You know That's easy to trace out to this black wire. Goes to the center tap. That makes sense. Like I say, then you could trace that black wire also down to the power socket. So that's a dead giveaway that that's, that's your negative. Uh, the orange wire, well, that's like I say, that's your that's your other DC connection. You could have done the same thing testing the switch here. You could have tested up to this switch, the orange wire, and then you would have found that it comes back out this brown wire, which goes to the top terminal. So that would have told you that's the DC connection. So there's just a few tips on uh, when you need to make up a power cord for something that has an oddball plug like this. Uh, now, radios can be completely different. This this is fairly simple. Two terminals for AC connection, two terminals for DC connection. If you get into old tube type radios, <laughs> you really need a schematic, or it's a lot more complicated than this. The reason is a lot of the old uh, tube type radios, uh, so we're talking older, than, not much older than this, but a little bit older than this back in the vacuum tube days, um, they very frequently used octal plugs. So it looks like a, a vacuum tube socket. Um, and the reason they use those is, is because it depended if it was going to be AC or DC. They actually have jumper wires that connect pins inside of that plug. So two of the pins will, will be for the AC cord, another two will be for DC. But depending how the power supplies and the transformers are set up in there, they can get very complicated, and it's be honestly best, unless you really know what you're doing, it's best to have a service manual to look at how the plug should be properly wired. 
Uh, and even then, double check the, the radio inside. Make sure somebody hasn't rewired that because I have found those octal sockets on the back of Lafayette's and God, just you name the old tube type brand that use the old octal plugs. Um, there are even amateur radios that have larger Sense Jones plugs that might have 10 or 12 terminals. I have seen seen radios and transceivers and transmitters before where someone rewired the socket on the inside. So now you go grab the schematic, get yourself a brand new plug plug to make up a power cord, you wire it up as the schematic says, plug it in, and the magic smoke comes out. We don't want magic smoke. Magic smoke's not a good thing. <laughs> so always make sure, if you have a schematic for the radios, make sure that the plug wasn't rewired. Don't know why people do that. They you know, probably burned it up and they just cut all the wires off and then just randomly stuck wires on there. It was fine for them. They were making up a new power matching power cord. They knew what the wiring was. But they didn't write it down and put a note inside the piece of equipment. So there's no way of knowing how that thing was wired. So yeah, always be careful with old vintage tube type equipment that has big power cords. Because yeah, there's, like I say, a lot of times the, those terminals, a lot of them will be jump actual jumpers, depending on if you're using an AC or DC power cord, they'll have jumpers inside that plug, and wire that thing up wrong, and yeah, the, the smoke will definitely come. I mean, you could wire this thing up, and the smoke will come out if you go shoving 120 volts in where there should only be 13.8, but uh, I hope that helps. So if you have something simple like this, like I say, really all you need, continuity tester, and you, you can very easily figure out the wiring for it.